this uh, this will be my last song. Well, maybe my second to last. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is my best known song. I actually uh, wrote it before I moved back to Austin, but I never got it off the ground until uh, I met Bob Johnston. And uh, Bob was a, a Texan from Fort Worth who was living in Nashville. He offered me my first recording deal. I used to play a little club called the Rubia, which was uh, a coffee house in Dallas. Uh, you have to understand the reason why, why Austin took off as a town and why Texas music scene took off when it did. Up until 1970, virtually not one county in Texas had public drinking. <laughs> Pro Prohibition was still in effect in most of the counties. I'm not kidding. You had uh, you had no liquor by the drink walking up to a bar until right around 1970 when they changed the rules. And statewide, a lot of people started uh, you know putting in bars. So up until then, it was all private clubs. So Austin was one of the first places where that really took off, and all of a sudden you have a lot of private clubs that went to be public clubs, like the Broken Spoke, places like that that are legendary now. And uh, suddenly there was a place for people to go, and students who were of, of an age, I mean, drinking age then was 21, but there were students around who were just getting out of four years that they were still around, and, of course, there were plenty of people using fake IDs to, uh, to go to bars and saloons. That's kind of how it, how it took off. And I was playing in these coffee houses, though, before that happened. Uh, it was kind of interesting because it wasn't about selling alcohol. It wasn't about doing cover songs. It was about coming up with original material. And people were sitting and drinking coffee and listening to your songs. So there was a little bit more focus on the actual material. And it was, uh, oddly enough, a, a scene that made it possible for people to write more original material because it, it wasn't just about a rowdy scene. And it was, it was kind of a listening audience. So in the middle of a show that I was doing there one time, in walks this guy named Bob Johnston. He said, I, I'm in town for my dad's funeral, but uh, I had to get away from all that. I just feel too sad, so I came down here to hear you play. And uh, he heard the show, and he said, would you like to come to Nashville and make a record? I said, well, I just came from Los Angeles, where a lot of people invited me to make a record, but uh, I wasn't, you know, very happy with that situation and, and, and the commercial music scene of L.A. at the time. So I said, so can you tell me a little bit about who you are as a producer? I mean, what do you do, you know? He said, what have you done lately, you know? And he said, uh, well, I, I produced Bob Dylan. Whoa! An album called Blonde on Blonde. And I uh, produced uh, an album called Highway 61 Revisited. And uh, let's see, what else did I do uh, for Bob? I did uh, Nashville Skyline. Whoa! <laughs> I said, okay, so what else? <laughs> I said, well, you know that that uh, that live album that Johnny Cash made in prison? Yeah, I, I, I produced that album, too. I said, okay, when did you want me in Nashville? <laughs> he said, well, you come as soon as you're ready. I said, okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That night after the show was over, I called my dad and I said, Dad, I'm coming straight home and uh, I got to pack as fast as I can because I'm, I'm going to Nashville. Now, I'm going to have to borrow your Buick because my, my Volkswagen bus wasn't working too well at the time. And I, I didn't want to take, take my little boy and my, my family, my, my wife there because it was just too, too tough of a trip. All night run. So I got in this Buick with my dad's and I drove straight to Nashville. When I got there, it was raining like crazy. And I called up Bob, he would give me his number on the payphone. And I said, hey Bob. He said, and I woke him up. I said, uh, I said hey Bob, I'm here. He said, you're where? I said, I'm in Nashville. 
He said, well, weren't you in Dallas last night? I said, yeah, but I, I drove straight through. And I'm here. I'm, I'm in Nashville. He said, well, wh why are you in Nashville? I said, well, because you said as soon as you're ready to make a record, and I'm ready right now. <laughs> he said, well, I don't know if I can get a studio that fast. And I have to tell you, you, I said, well, yeah, well, I've heard those excuses before. Maybe I should just pack up and go home. He said, no, I'm going to make a few phone calls. He said, the only studio available in town is Columbia Studio A. And it's a, it's a big studio. He said, uh, it's going to be just you and your guitar in there. We're going to lay down some songs. So uh, tomorrow, we'll get to work on this. How long are you going to be in town? I said, as long as it takes. <laughs> So we laid down 40 songs, just me and my bass player, Bob Livingston. Whoa. And uh, we said that those are nice demos, uh, Bob, when we're going to make the real album. And he said, I think you just did. Whoa. I said, well, you're not going to use 40 songs. He said, no, he said, we'll pick 10 or 12 songs and put it on the record, but uh, I want to add everything else to it because it's multi-track recording. I said, yeah, I know all about that. We have... We, I recorded on some of the first four track recorders in the head in, in, in LA because I was in the songwriting scene. He said, well, we're just going to add everything else. You know, we, we're, up to, we're up to 12 tracks now. <laughs> but we can add on there. So that's what they did. He said, you can leave town. I'm going to put all the other stuff on there. We eventually came back. I came back with Gary Nunn. And uh, he sang on the record. And Leonard Arnold, who was my lead guitar player, played lead guitar on this song and uh, so this is my second to last <laughs> there's a title song of that album I should explain I, I was an activist for Indian civil rights at that time I've been driving up to South Dakota a lot to register voters who were Indians even though the civil rights movement was big and I'd been involved in that, the Indians were kind of overlooked and all that. So this is a protest song. My first single was a protest song for Indian rights. And it was banned in the state of Texas. It was also banned in Boston because they banned everything in Boston. Eventually, though, it did well enough other places that a few Texas radio stations played it. They put Geronimo in jail down south where he couldn't look to give tours in the mouth. Sergeant, Sergeant, don't you feel something wrong with your auto?
Thank you.